amidst concentrated wealth and widespread poverty, violence spontaneously erupts in the struggle between organized labor and their bosses. Tensions spill over at a May 4th working man's rally in Haymarket Square when a bomb is tossed into marching police ranks, killing seven and injuring dozens. For several weeks, the press whips the city into a furor as it anticipates the trial of those accused. Facing public scrutiny and risking their professional careers, the defense team meets for the first time. Eight lives hang in the balance. This trial is coming too quickly. I, I don't see how we're gonna pull this together in time. And the papers, they're, they're setting our men on fire. George, the first thing I'll do is motion for a delay. It's a vengeful man coming. Any moment now. Good afternoon, sirs. Captain Black, I presume. You must be George Schilling. <clears throat> Which leaves Solomon and Zeitzler. Yes? I... I'm William Foster, but you knew that already. Mr. Foster, thank you for coming. We're grateful to have your trial experience on our team. Thank you, Captain. Well, let's get to it. There are three important things to discuss, gentlemen. First, what of this Judge Rogers, who made his bias so eminently clear in the grand jury? I pressed the matter, and Rogers will recuse himself. I've already met with State's Attorney Grinnell, and we're looking for a replacement. Excellent. This Grinnell is the agreeable sort. Agreeable is not the word I would use. Yeah, never mind that. Secondly, what is our plan for selecting a jury? After all, we may have a tough time of it when the Tribune's headline reads, Dynamite Cult Leaders Jailed, Parsons at Large. This is my chief concern. As I was telling the men here, Mr. Foster, how can we possibly find an impartial jury when they're already being tried and convicted in the papers? <clears throat> Sigmund and I are very confident in our criteria for jury selections. Sir, we are well prepared. We believe that with a fair pool of good citizens, we should be able to find a reasonable 12 and move our defense forward. Prepared, are you? Jury selection is one thing. Just wait until we get into the teeth of this trial. Solomon, of the eight accused, how many were at the May 4 rally? Uh, three, son. Burn the notes. You're a German. Of the eight accused, how many are from the fatherland? Um. Uh, six. Wrong, I mean. five. Neeb is American, born of German blood. One is English and one is a Texan. Gentlemen, are we truly going to run this ravine like a bunch of city folks stuck in a flash flood? Lastly, the prosecution aims to build their case around a charge of murder against eight men, but they have no bomb thrower. The prosecution knows this. And they also know that unless some fiend suddenly repents his deed and comes to confess, they have nothing. But if they know they cannot convict with the murder charge, they have to move to another plan, no? Precisely, son. Now you're catching on. All they have is innuendo, lies, fear-mongering. This is not an atmosphere in which reason can breathe. I believe they'll move towards conspiracy. Conspiracy? To do what? Conspiracy to commit murder against police officers. But how can you have accessories without a principal? Exactly. And how can the prosecution argue conspiracy when the men were in all different places? Some at work, some drinking in Sepp's Hall. Well, heck, one man was even on the wagon when the bomb was thrown. Does this sound like the behavior of men involved in a 
conspiracy? It most certainly does not. But I will not be on that jury. And neither will you. If all eight men stand in that courtroom, it will be all too easy to connect them as one. All conspirators, all guilty of murder. The way to dismantle this conspiracy is to motion for separate trials for each man. In so doing, we will erase the imaginary lines the prosecution attempts to draw between our defendants. For example, why should Spies and Nieb be called bomb makers simply because police found these materials in Ling's bedroom trunk? Demand a new jury and a new courtroom for every single defendant, as is their constitutional right. Put the supremely difficult human obstacles of time and doubt and space in the way, and their will to convict. Will slowly extinguish. Though I appreciate the object lesson, Foster, the truth is you don't know this town. Both you and Mr. Schilling remarked that the papers have all but convicted our men. So we must turn the papers and their readers in our favor. You see, this town thrives on drama. It churns on the sensational. Where well, there's a, a two-bit theater on every block. And do you know what's happening in those theaters? Why, the sixpenny offered to hang the men on stage for the public to see, one each night of the week. But that's my point, Schilling. That foolishness must stop. And how do you propose we stop it, Captain? By giving them superior drama, Mr. Schilling. An undeniable scene, an act of courage that will counter all a slander. Albert Parsons. Bullseye, Solomon. Do you mean willingly bring Parsons back to Chicago? Back into harm's way? We will march him into that courtroom on his own freedom and volition. What jury would convict a man who returned to stand trial with his brothers? A guilty man would do no such thing. Sirs! I cannot, as his counselor, make a recommendation that Mr. Parsons, who I believe has done nothing wrong, return to this bloodthirsty arena. He is safe now. Why return him into harm's way? It seems foolhardy to advocate such a strategy. If he does not return now, they most assuredly will hunt him down like a rabid dog for the rest of his life. I'm giving Parsons an opportunity to express his innocence, to face his accusers with dignity. You're giving him the opportunity to be hung! Foster! Your reputation precedes you. But I did not receive the honors of war by standing in the back of my men. With all due respect, sir, that war is long over. This is an entirely new country.